Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. You're going to be fascinated by our next guest, Richard Lederer. If you read Boomer Times, and hopefully you do, you'll see he has unique columns every month, whether it's poker or whether it's uh, on the correct language. But this time, he said we're going to do something on dogs and cats, and I always love that. So, Richard, in San Diego, what's the weather like first? Pretty nice and fairly cool in the evening. Uh, and I, you know, I'm an avid tennis player, and uh, I play three, four times a week. And um, I'm not melting out there, let's put it that way. And then at night, with the lights on, it's very nice. So I don't want to make anybody jealous, but <laughs> best weather in the world. Yeah, well, it's a wonderful I, city, and I know you've lived there a long time. So, okay, tell me why you decided to do something on dogs and cats. Well, it turns out that on the 26th of September... Uh, there's something called Remember Me Thursday, and uh, it aims to unite people and pet adoption organizations in more than 180 countries around the world as one voice for orphan pets in need of forever homes. Uh, So we have millions of beautiful adoptable pets who can lose their lives um, unless they get adopted into one of those homes. And so that inspires me to talk about dogs and cats. And let me just say, if anyone is interested in this uh, Remember Me Thursday, it's at, I'll say it slowly, one word, I mean, no space, rememberMeThursday.org, and preceded by HTTPS. Uh, Or you just go to Remember Me Thursday on the net, and you'll get that information. We are the most pet-loving Sorry, pet-loving nation in the world. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi, we all know who he is, said, uh, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be measured by the way in which its animals are treated. Hmm. And I think many of us have been to other nations where the animals live on the streets uh, and uh, or like in a place like Russia, we know this from the Sochi Olympics, they're just Dogs are seen as vermin, and, you know, they're just people go out to kill them. It's awful. But uh, we are a very pet-loving nation, and um, it turns out that one in three families, more than that, 39% of American families own a dog, uh, the highest dog population in the world. So let me tell you a little bit uh, about... Why do we love the doggies? Let us count the ways. Okay. So I'm going to give some of those. All right. And this is a preview of my column. The dogs are highly companionable, obedient, and playful animals. No other creature on earth shares our homes and our lives the way dogs do. It's the greatest, most unique interspecies relationship uh, on the planet. Uh, and you may know uh, out there, listeners, that you know long, long ago, uh, dogs. There, there were wild dogs, uh, really wolves. All dogs, even Chihuahuas and Yorkies, uh, have a wolf at heart. Um, and they, and we would have our villages, we humans, and some of the tamer would come closer, a little closer. And ultimately, we started breeding the tamer ones. And within about six generations, you start to get blazes uh, on the face, and they start barking, and darn it, they become dogs. (laughs) And we each made each other because the dog guarding the entrance to the cave, uh, catching vermin, helping with the hunting, allowed our the, the front of our frontal part of our brains to evolve. Uh, and make us human, and we protecting the dogs. They were they became dogs rather than wolves, um, with uh, smaller skulls and uh, a whole bunch of other things. And here's an interesting thing, Anita. Over time, um, we, we all know about that googly look that melts our hearts, don't we, from dogs? Well, that's because of muscles up above the eye that allow dogs to do that. And over time. We've seen archaeologically 
that dogs develop those muscles so that they could please us with their googly looks. <laughs> wolves do not have that muscle, and huskies that are close to wolves also don't have that muscle. A, a husky can't do it, but all other breeds can. And it is just typical of how more and more they were there to please us, and we fell in love with them, even though dogs are wolves at heart. Dogs seem to view us uh, as members of their pack, and we have viewed uh, dogs <clears throat> as adopted sons and daughters who are short, hairy, walk on all fours, and possess rudimentary speech. Here's something that'll move your heart. They show us their finest selves. The British romantic poet Lord Byron wrote on the tomb of his Newfoundland, and I'm quoting, Near this spot are deposited the remains of one who possessed beauty without vanity, strength without insolence, courage without ferocity, and all the virtues of man without his vices. This uh, praise, which would be unmeaning flattery if inscribed over human ashes, is but a just tribute to the memory of Boson, a dog. Yeah, I, I love what you're doing, of course, because I, I have rescued quite a few dogs. I now have okay. one that has um, pancreatitis and his oh. back legs don't work, but he's... He has such great spirit. We just take care of him, and he's all right. Unconditional love. Yep. You know, and um, they come into our lives to teach us about love, and they depart too soon to yeah. teach us about loss. Um, uh, just a quote from my book on dogs called A Treasury for Dog Lovers that I think summarizes this whole thing, and then... I'd love to get the cats. I, I think we've got time. Yes. But think about it. We give dogs what time we can spare, what space we can spare, what food we can spare, and what love we can spare. In return, dogs give us everything. It's the best deal we human beings have ever made. That's true. And just, you said something about cats. Cats don't require the same, and they don't give the same, but they don't require the same attention either. That is correct, and I'll talk about that, and that is why we have more cats than dogs in our homes. They don't require the same care, and it's a different evolutionary line. So let's go to cats, if I may. Okay. You are the cat's meow with all the good work that you do there, <laughs> Anita Finley. Um, well, in ancient Egypt, cats were worshipped as gods, and they've never forgotten that. And you probably know that a dog... Uh, looks around in the home <clears throat> and uh, sees these shadowy figures, you know, that's us, the human beings, and says, those big people, they give me um, a, a shelter, uh, they keep the, the, the rain and the cold out, they feed me delicious food, they give me a comfortable bed to sleep in, they must be gods. <laughs> Well, a cat says, looking at those same figures, you can see what's coming. Um, I can. Well, I, I, I have shelter, uh, delicious food, uh, a comfortable bed to uh, live in. I must be a god. <laughs> and, and, and the ancients were amazing. Uh, cats were worshipped as gods, mm -hmm. as I said. Uh, killing a sacred cat was punishable by death. When a family cat died, the entire family would shave off their eyebrows as a sign of mourning, and in their cat's burial sites, Egyptians would place embalmed mice as after snacks, uh, afterlife snacks. Uh, but then it didn't go so well in the Middle Ages. They had a pagan association. Uh, they were associated with uh, witches. And uh, now cats have had quite a comeback. Uh, the most popular pet in our nation is the cat. 90 million feline Americans reside here compo compared to 77 million canine Americans. And incidentally, a distant third is 14 million parakeet or parrot Americans. But more than one in, more than one in three U.S. families is graced by a cat. A lower number of families, because you can have more cats, and especially on farms, 
Uh, so that that's why you have more cats per domicile. Now, this should come as no surprise. We humans are beguiled by the mysterious aloofness of cats, their swift prowess as hunters, their uh, sensuous uh, sculpted bodies, their elegant acrobatic grace and agility, their kittenish curiosity and mischief, and their regal dignity. Uh, our lives with cats are not only ennobled and dogs, they're made longer because studies show that owning a cat or a dog alleviates loneliness, anxiety, and depression, reduces stress, high blood pressure, and heart disease, and adds six months to the average person's life. Incidentally, if you're a dog lover, you are, here's a fancy word, caninophile, file from philos in Greek meaning lover or love, and ilurophiles, uh, again from Greek, uh, of cats. Cats warm our laps and our hearts, give us someone to talk to and to spoil, turn common household objects into cat toys, donate their services as alarm clocks, are living adornments to our home, <laughs> keep mice on the run, remind us that life can still be wild and mysterious, inspire poets, writers, movie makers, creators of musical theater, artists, and cartoonists, and hold the purr strings to <laughs> our hearts. These animals indeed leave paw prints uh, on our hearts, both doggies and kitties, and that big adopt day again is Thursday, uh, the 26th of September, and I hope a number of people out there will adopt some of these wonderful animals. I was thinking as you were talking about the wonderful Broadway play Cats, which was just incredible, wasn't it? It was, and I'm a big T.S. Eliot fan, and you know <clears throat> that he, who was very big when you and I were you know, studying English in, in high school and college, um, he's primarily remembered for cats, because that is from his book of cats. Yes. And and uh, his widow, uh, the stipulation was that none of the words from the poems would be changed. And for a long time, that was the longest running uh, play on uh, on Broadway. But, you know, how many people now know the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, <laughs> uh, the four quartets, um, all of that stuff? Um, but they do know cats. That's true, and and some of the w wonderful songs that remain. But the outfits on the cats were just so cute. I mean, that was it. Really, really did a job with that. And I don't know. Is there another? Is there a Broadway show about dogs particularly? I don't. Well, we had Isle of Dogs, uh, which sounds like I love dogs, uh, right. recently as a film. And you, I think, you said you've seen the art of racing yes, in the rain. Yes, I did. It was incredible. Fabulous, fabulous yeah. book, uh, and these books uh, that that in which the dog is the narrator right. are terrific. And I especially recommend uh, a dog's purpose. And now we have a dog's journey with Dennis Quaid, the new one, the third one out. Terrific books, terrific movies, and I know a dog's purpose, which is in the middle of the triad, is streaming. In fact, I just saw it on FX channel. And I couldn't write. It's one of the best dog movies I've ever seen. Well, the dogs and cats are, as you said, we do respect them here. We do take care of them here. And many are feral, which is a little sad. But there are people who are able to take those feral cats, and they do get them back trained. I have a friend that does that. Not, not wow. at first, but then if they have other cats, they kind of certain certainly join together. My son and his wife had some wild cats uh, out in the back of their house and they the female kept having more kittens and they went and they had them all n i guess neutered i mean they had them right. you know and 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 they stay there now they don't go anywhere and they're they don't come in the house although the kids want to have them come in because they do have a, another cat in the house which is a family cat but they're just together, and it's beautiful because most people just take them and get rid of them. And I am in a situation at 81 in which uh, we had these two wonderful dogs, both uh, and fairly large dogs who lived a long time, beyond quite beyond their lifespan. But at this stage, 
I've just, you know, um, the dog is probably going to outlive me, and I know that we can foster, but I'm just so busy. We have not had new dogs, but we miss Mike and Bart uh, terribly. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we don't have any dogs or cats. Well, it's true. There comes a point then where your life just is a little bit too complicated. And yet sometimes one will arrive on your doorstep or from a friend, and you just have to take it. Gotcha. Well, that's your big heart uh, that is easily (laughs) left paw prints uh, uh, upon. Um, I I get you. I have someone, I have a friend who has, takes all cats, seven, eight, she has so many cats. And when one passes away, she gets the paw print, you know, when they cremate, has them in her closet. She says, they're still with me. Now, I don't go that far, but she does. She's, she says they're still here in the house. Hey, I have to give you my two favorite uh, cat jokes, uh, okay. if I could. You could. Uh, what's the difference between a cat and a comma? I have no idea. Well, a cat, a, 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 the answer is a cat has claws at the end of its paws. And a comma, of course, is a pause at the end of a clause. <laughs> that's good. Oh, you got to put that more... in, the, in your article. You have to do that. That's terrific. Well, uh, I think the article may already be too long for you. So. Okay. All right. um, and, and also, it's kind of serious, as you see. So mm, I, I, I think if, if, if the tone would be disturbed. And the other is, have you heard about the cat who ate some cheese and breathed into a mouse hole? and waited with bated breath. <laughs> now, the joke there, and I can yeah. see you got it, is the right. real spelling is B-A-T-E-D, right. meaning abated. Yes, <laughs> yes. Oh, that, but, that's... Uh, but with the cheese, it comes out as B-A-I-T-E-D. Right. And I'll mention to you, in, in terms of things being left on your doorstep, I've told you quite sincerely that I've written my last book, The Joy of Names, my 50th, so a nice number, my 34th language book. Uh, I figured that was it, and I haven't written a new book in two years. But a publishing company has made an offer to me that I can't refuse. Oh, my. And I have just finished, in about less than a month, a 60,000-word book called Verbivore Banquet um, that is uh, a kind of all over the place, uh, the kinds of things I do with a lot of etymology, word origins. But darn it, it's come back, and most of my friends are going, Nina, Nina, Rich, you said that was your last book. Well, right. yes, but I have an open mind without having a <laughs> hole in my head. <laughs> and uh, the point is, this came along, it worked, it was a generous offer, and therefore I took it, and I have just had a blast. And in fact, I just finished up an advanced draft this morning before <laughs> y'all called me. Wow, that's amazing. I want to give everybody your website. It's verbivore, V-E-R-B-I-V-O-R-E dot com, verbivore dot com. So you can go on the website and you'll see all his books. You'll see Richard Letterer's books and you'll see all these interesting things that he does. And and of course, the last issue that we had in our, what well, just came out now, our August issue, he has been very involved with poker, his kids and our big poker stars. And it's called English Lays Its Cards on the Table of Our Tongue. It was very good. And that's in part because it's the 50th year of uh, the main event, the World Series of Poker, uh, started back in 69. And um, it's, uh, uh, I can only say, the greatest game ever invented. And I'm a word person, but I play high-stakes poker. uh, And it just develops other parts of my brain. The, sorry, the... uh, Why does it... uh, Okay, well, I was just, while you're doing that, I just want to ask you a question. Why did they have the high-stakes poker tournament in law in uh, Lost Wages, Nevada. You right. meant lost, not Lost Wages. It's Las Vegas, right? Of course, but I was. Oh, you're being funny. There. Okay, and um, you do lose your wages there. Folks. I'm sure. Me, and you know, and but, why yeah. did why did you why are you so fascinated with poker? Well, especially Texas Hold'em. Uh, first of all, it's social, uh, especially good for men who get less of that than women. Uh, and second, it is a game that has everything. 
It has its statistical, if you're playing it at a reasonably high level. Uh, it is musical. There's a rhythm. Position around the table is important. Um, it is biographical. Uh, I am quite good at knowing the history of each player I'm playing against so that when they make a certain big bet, I can say, okay, what's the history of this person with this kind of bet? Huh? Is it a bluff or is it the real thing? What are the odds? And, and it's that. A lot more. It's the ability to read other people's body language. And remember, Anita, you know, there's never been a game invented that I haven't played. Uh, I have written a book on bridge called Building Bridge. Um, I have, um, uh, I play chess as an undergraduate. I still am a chess coach. Uh, and as I always like to chuckle, I used to be a Scrabble champion, but I be became inconsonant. And I can't move my vowels anymore. And I can't move my vowels anymore. I've given them all up for this amazing game. And you can start off at fifty cents a dollar, and so on. I run a tournament here every uh, month, and we'll pay your gas if you want to come to it. No, we won't because they're hard games to get into. But they're lovely. We get to know each other. We're bonded, and of course, I am the most successful breeder of world-class poker players in history, having two children, and the third one ain't bad either, <laughs> but two children who have won $11.5 million, and my daughter Annie Duke um, is, uh, for quite a while, was the winningest woman in the history of the game. Mm -hmm. She actually feels women have an advantage in poker. Why? First, because men will just, you know, hey, honey, you know, I really do have that flush. It's going to beat your straight fold. So you fold and save yourself $800. <laughs> and second, that women have a better sense of body language from the other players and uh, more intuition. So a lot of women, oh, my gosh, I couldn't play. I wear my heart on my sleeve, this, that, and the other thing. Eh, Give it a try. You see my daughter, now mother of four, and a terrific mom, she did fine with it, winning, winning millions. Well, um, talking about that, when I go to the casino here locally, and I'm doing something else, and I happen to be there, uh, I don't sit at any of the tables. I mean, I look at them, but they, they think they start at, what, I don't know, $20 or more money than... I don't know enough to... Well, to know how to play, yeah. so I don't do that. I and just play don't. the little slots. I just do that for fun and probably right. spend ten dollars. But, but when you go to see a table now, anywhere you go, do you analyze who the the dealer is? What What do you do? You look at the people. Well, the sitting? dealer is is the casino person, so there's nothing right. to analyze there. Well, uh, and indeed, the games I play with, we have professional dealers in. But I certainly look at the others. I tend not to play in casinos because. Um, first of all, you're giving a quote-unquote rake to the casino. Mm. Uh, you don't know the other players. In my games, they're all home games with a professional dealer that wh whom we pay for. Uh, and, um, you know, we play, and I know as much as I possibly can of about these other players. Who's strong, who's weak, whom I want to isolate. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and, and at our casinos here, middle of the night, and you will get seven or eight tables <laughs> playing. Uh, people like it, you know, and the better ones tend to stay, and the ones that are going broke tend to leave. So in general, you're playing against pretty good players. But why should I go to a casino when I have about three excellent home games, uh, you know, that are a lot nearer within a half hour, and I play? and really enjoy it as long as I get up every once in a while and just don't sit the whole time because right. I want to avoid DVT, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the deep vein thrombosis. Right. Well, tell but, me, how long does it usually a whole game take? I know you're going to get up and get down, but right. But what are you looking at? Are you looking at hours? Five hours. <gasps> Five hours? Yeah, and believe me, for some people, that's not nearly long enough. Well, a game can be forever, I yeah, mean, or it could right. be five minutes, I mean, because it's constantly a different hand, and the dealer moves around, but um, 
but my games are typically 5.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m., and then, you know, we count up, uh, and, uh, you know, that that's it. But I know other games that go up to nine hours because it is so fascinating and mm-hmm. you don't want to leave. And often it's, oh, if I only had that one other hand. And, gee, while we're going on, I want to clarify one thing for your listeners, our listeners, and that is people say, gee, your children, when they walk into a casino, don't they get thrown out? because they're so good. Right. And the answer is this. If it's blackjack, yes, because because um, you are against the house, and if you are good enough in blackjack, you will beat the house. Yes, you're And the house nervous. will then say to you, let's say, Anita, Anita Finley, uh, you're a very good player. We really like you as a person. Right. <laughs> But, uh, and we like your company, but we reserve the right and we are not going to let you play blackjack in our uh, establishment or in any other in our consortium. And in fact, we have your iris on record, so you cannot get in. But that's blackjack because you're taking their money. But in poker, the players are against each other. And you know, and I, therefore, I, I have guess. to, and, and I'm getting this signal that we have to stop. So poker's different, and maybe another time we can talk about that. But okay. I this love seemed, the conversation, Richard. This seemed to have gone much longer than the other. Well, right? I don't know why, but Richard, it this was fantastic. Thank you again, and stay. I'm so glad you wrote the book, and I'll be talking to you again soon. Okay. And and let me just make make one thing clear. I don't play tennis Wednesday mornings anymore. Okay. Well, okay. thank you. So <laughs> okay. I'm more I'm more available. Bye bye, love. Thank you so much, Richard. Bye.